you would take your Bibles and open them to Joshua chapter 9. We are going to be in all 27 verses. I'm going to talk you through some of the verses this morning, um, and then we're going to look, we're going to hone in on just a few uh, verses and look at them in depth. A few weeks ago, I got the opportunity uh, to preach Joshua chapter 6, which was a lot more exciting than Joshua uh, chapter 9, but I really feel that 6, 7, 8, and 9 are kind of all a, uh, a continuation story. We got to see these, these key elements of walking in victory in chapter 6. We got to see that we have to wait on the Lord to have victory. We, we, have to have a, we have to have the right heart attitudes. We have to have a worshipful heart, a servant's heart, a holy heart. To walk in victory, we've got to expect obstacles to be in our path. But we've got to walk in obedience no, no matter how difficult those obstacles are. We have to be obedient even when it looks foolish. And we've got to have faith that God has already won the war. And we have to have faith that only God can tear down the walls. That's what victory looks like. But last week we saw something. Tim preached a sermon about something that can hinder victory. He preached on sin, and that's not an easy um, It's not an easy topic to talk about because we like to talk about victory. But let me say this, that sin is one of the greatest foes of victory. And this morning, I get the opportunity to preach to you about deception. Those two things, sin and deception, are are great obstacles to walking in victory. Last week we saw that Israel had to deal with their sin. They had to take Achan. You remember Achan took some of the devoted things, some of the things that were supposed to go into the Lord's treasury and he kept them for himself. And because of that, all Israel was in jeopardy of God's judgment. So we learn that sin disrupts victory. Well, this morning we are going to learn that deception disrupts victory. That is really the point of chapter nine, deception. And deception, just so you get a good definition of it, it it, it means to be tricked or to be deceived into believing something that is false. You are tricked into sin, but it is sin nonetheless. So sin and deception go hand in hand, and they are two huge enemies of victory. So this morning we're going to learn how to have victory over deception. And I want to walk you through chapter 9. You don't have to you don't have to read along with me. I'm just going to give you some of the high points of chapter 9 and then we're going to dig in a little deeper into about 5 verses. So here's the basic story of chapter 9. All of the kings west of the Jordan uh, have heard about the victories that Israel is having over Jericho and Ai. The majority of the kings form an alliance to fight against Israel, with the exception of the Gibeonites. You see, instead of fighting, they're going to use deception. They're going to make a ruse, a deceptive plan. And here's their plan. They're going to take some worn out sacks and put them over their donkeys. They're going to take some old wine skins and put them on display. They're going to put patches all over their clothes and all over their shoes. And they're going to carry sacks of moldy, dried out bread. You see, what they want to do is they want to, they, they want to make it seem like they've traveled many, many miles to come to the promised land. And evidently, the Gibeonites had some knowledge of Scripture. They knew from Deuteronomy chapter 7 that Israel was supposed to destroy everyone that lived in the promised land. 
And they also knew that Deuteronomy 20 allows Israel to make a peace treaty with foreigners that move into the land. So they have to destroy everybody that lives currently in the land, but if someone moves in from afar, they can make a peace treaty with that nation. So they obviously have some knowledge. They've found a loophole to fight him. See, they don't want to fight him straight up. They found a way to pretend to be from a distant land, and instead of having war, they have peace. And it's interesting how they come to the Israelites. They say, we have come because of the fame of your God. We've heard about his fame in Egypt. We've heard about his fame in Canaan. And they come to swear allegiance to Israel and to pledge their service to Israel. And it says that Joshua and the leaders, they make no attempt to ask for the Lord's counsel. And they make a peace treaty and they, they, they swear an oath before God and before the Gibeonites. Now, three days later, Israel finds out what has happened. They find out that the Gibeonites actually live in the land and it says the whole community of Israel grumbled against his leaders. If you think about it, they have been on this roller coaster ride for several chapters. They've crossed over to the Jordan only to be circumcised. They've had victory only to have to stone Achan. They're just on this roller coaster ride and now they realize we have done something foolish once again and they grumble against the leaders. And the leaders say back to the the people, We can't do anything against the Gibeonites. We have to honor what we have oathed to God. We cannot touch them. And Joshua goes to the Gibeonites and he says, why have you deceived us? And they respond honestly. They said, because we feared for our lives. We feared for our lives. That's that's a true statement. And the Gibeonites say, now we're in your hands. Do do with us whatever you think is right. And Joshua will curse them. And he says, you you will be water carriers and woodcutters for the community, the Israelite community, and for the Lord's altar. So that's the story of deception. That's the deception of the Gibeonites. Now let's look in depth at some few a few verses and make some observations that will help us not fall into the same trap as Israel did. Let's go to verse three of chapter nine. Verses three and four. It says, when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they acted deceptively. And so the first point that we need to make if we're gonna have victory over deception is we must realize that deceptive plans are being hatched every day against the people of God. You see, Israel expected a straight up fight. They expected to go from town to town, people to come out and engage them, or they go and engage the people. They were not expecting a ruse. They were not expecting deception. But we need to understand if we're gonna have victory, deceptive plans are being hatched every day against the people of God. Listen to what it says in Ephesians. Ephesians 6 verse 12. It says, our battle is not against flesh and blood. That gives us some great insight. A lot of times we think in our battles and in our victories and in deception, we're just dealing with this world. We're just dealing with flesh and blood. But Paul tells us that our battle is is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, authorities, against the world powers of darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. I don't, know, I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty serious. That sounds like that there's a lot of higher powers that are planning our demise. 
Our battle is not just against things that we see, but against things that we cannot see. And they are using deception. Let's look at 1 Peter 5, 8. Peter says this, he says, be serious, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. Now, I know that many of you have seen um, documentaries on National Geographic's or the Animal Planet. You understand how lions work, okay? They don't come right out and say, hey, I'm a lion, I'm gonna eat you. They work deceptively. They prowl around, and usually what they do is they use what's called ambush tactics. They get the, they get the herd running, and then they have a bunch of lions waiting to pounce. It's a deceptive plan. We have to understand that we have an adversary, not only adversaries on this world, but we have adversaries in the spiritual realm that are prowling around. They don't, they don't play straight to our face. They are prowling and looking to ensnare us, looking to devour us. And Paul says this, or P Peter says this, he says, be serious. And really what he's saying here is, this is a serious matter. This is for real. You can't just walk around thinking that every deception is gonna be easy to spot. It's, it's, it's a serious business. And it says to be alert. Do you realize we're walking in the tall grass as Christians and we don't know what's lurking beyond um, the horizon? There is always this threat of deception. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says this. Paul says, I have done this so that you might not be taken advantage of by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. Paul says, I don't want you to be taken advantage of, and you need to know something, Satan has a playbook. He's got schemes. He's got plans. If we're going to seriously defeat deceptions in our life, we've got to realize that deceptions are real that the schemes are real. Students, many of you have graduated high school, you're going off to college next year, some of you going to a Christian college, some of you going to a secular college. Let me tell you, in either place, there are powers at work right now that are planning your demise. If you don't take them seriously, you'll be devoured. That's, that, is the, that is the truth from Scripture. And that is true for all of us. There is deception that is working right now to defeat us, to defeat our testimonies, to destroy our families, to destroy our children. We have to heed the warning of Peter. We've got to take this seriously. We've got to believe that it exists, and we've got to be alert. We've got to be prepared. If we're going to defeat it, we've got to realize that it is an imminent threat to all of us. Let's move to verse six. I'm going to read verses six through 10. It says, they went to Joshua's camp at Gilgal and they said to him, men of Israel, we have come from a distant land. Please make a treaty with us. The men of Israel replied to the Hivites, perhaps you live amongst us. How can we make a treaty with you? And they said, Joshua, we are your servants. Then Joshua asked them, who are you and where do you come from? And they replied to him, your servants have come from a faraway land because of the reputation of the Lord your God. For we have heard of his fame and all that he has done in Egypt and all that he did to the two Amorite kings beyond the Jordan. This is an interesting little text of scripture here. And again, it tells us something about deception. It, it tells us that deception many times uses spiritual language. Many times it uses scripture. 
A lot of times out of context. If we're going to have victory over deception, we've got to understand that. So many times we think that deception is going to walk up to us with two horns on his head, red skin, and a pitchfork. It's going to be easy to spot. But listen to the language that the Gibeonites use. It sounds so spiritual. We have heard about the greatness of your God. We have come to serve you. We've come because of the fame of your God. All of that sounds like religious speak. It sounds so sincere. But it is deceptive. And again, we we understand from this that the Gibeons understood some scripture. They understood that there was a loophole. If we come from a foreign nation, maybe they'll make a peace treaty with us. If not, if we just continue to live here, they will destroy us. So they are doing the best that they can to deceive, and they are using spiritual talk. Listen to 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. 14. It says this, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Okay? He doesn't come to us as the, as the horned red devil. He comes to us looking like a glorious angelic being. And many times he comes speaking and preaching truth. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians 1, 8. He says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you another gospel other than the one we preach to you, a curse be on him. This is a clear warning from Paul. He's saying deception is real. He says, if we come to you, Paul knows his his tendencies. He knows that he can fall to deception. And he says, we preach to you the true gospel, but if I come back to you preaching another gospel, do not believe it. You see, deception sometimes comes in the form of a false gospel. And then he says that even angels can come to you and deceive you preaching a false gospel. You know what this verse tells me? tells me that we have to know the gospel. We have to know the word of God because deception does not, it is not easily spotted. It can come in the form of a preacher. It can come in the form of an angel of light. And it says, curse be on that deceiver. That's what, that's what deception brings. It brings a curse. We know that In Matthew chapter four, Jesus being tempted by Satan, you know, what was was one of the things Satan did? He used scripture. He used scripture on Jesus. He kind of take, he took it out of context, but again, it sounded spiritual. Matthew 7, 15, it says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. Again, this this is a proof text for, for, for Joshua 9. Sheep coming to you, looking like a sheep, speaking like a sheep, talking about spiritual things, talking about how great God is, but inwardly, what are they? They're wolves. They're wolves. They are pretending to be sheep, but they are not. I want to tell you that there is one sure way uh, to defend yourself against deception to defend yourself against false gospels, to defend yourself, even if an angel of light were to come to you and preach a false gospel, here it is. You've got to know the word of God. We've got to be a people that knows the word of God so well that we can spot deception. Psalm 119 is the greatest testimony of the power of God's word. And it tells us in there that the word of God can keep us pure. The word of God can keep us on the right path. It can keep us from sinning against God. It is life-giving. It gives salvation. And it lights our path. We have to be people of the word or we will fall to deception. Again, students, if you don't know the word, you're in trouble. You are in trouble. 
I know you need to study for your schooling, but you've got to be studying the word of God or you will fall every time to deception. And even if you're at a Christian college, there is even deception there. Be careful. Know the word of God. Scripture says that the word of God is living and active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It is the strongest, most powerful thing that we can have in our lives. It penetrates to the dividing of soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of our heart. And listen to this. It says, no creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eye of him whom we must give an account. When you have the word dwelling in you richly, working in you, and deception comes, God puts a light on that. The word of God working in your heart puts a light on that. And you know what? You do see that deception very clearly. You do see it, and you can walk in victory. But you've got to be people of the word. I've got to be a, a, a person of the word. We have to know the word. Let's move on to verses 12 through 15. The Gibeonites told Joshua, they said, this bread of ours was warm when we took it from our houses, when we, when we left to come to you. But take a look, it's now dry and crumbly. These wineskins were new, but now they're cracked. Our clothes were new, but now they've got patches all over them because of the extremely long journey. The men of Israel took a look at their provisions. They did not seek the counsel of the Lord, and they established a peace treaty with them. I'm going to tell you this. If we're going to have victory over deception, we have to be people of faith. Not a people of sight, logic, and sympathy. Faith is trusting in something that we do not see. They were obviously looking at something and were persuaded by something, but we are not called to be persuaded by sight. We are to be people of faith, seeking the Lord, seeking his plan, meditating, praying, waiting. You know, that's what Paul says. That's how we do spiritual battle. In Ephesians 6, 18, you know, it says that we put on all of this armor of God. Well, what do we do when the armor's on? We pray. We pray in the spirit with every kind of prayer and request and we stay alert with all perseverance and we make intercession for all of the saints. That's how we do battle. When these people came to Joshua, he should have said, hold on. What, what you say looks like it could be right, but I need to go pray. I need to go counsel with my God. I need to ask him about this situation. I need to be perseverant in my, in my faith. But what did Joshua do? He did not seek the Lord's counsel. He based his decision on unreliable things. Sight. He looked at their clothes and said, well, what they say and what their clothes look like, that makes sense. Logic. Well, that seems logical that if if you were on this long journey that the sun and the, and the, and the desert conditions and all these things would, would tear up your clothes and dry out your food. I even think some were sympathetic. They heard this religious talk and they said, oh, look at these people. They've come so far. They've risked everything. I feel for them. Let's bring them in. I'm telling you, if we make decisions based on these things, we will get in trouble every time. Think about decisions that you make based on sight. A lot of times they're not good decisions. We look at something, we covet it, we want it, we think about it, we make it an idol. Men, you know the deception of sight. You know what kind of havoc that it can wreak. Logic. You know, I have a saying that we made up a long time ago. I tell people that they can outwit themselves. 
If they're just overly smart, they just outwit themselves. They think about it too much. They're, they're too logical about things. Joshua looked at this and he says, well, this is logical. Okay, their, their stuff is dried out. Their clothes are torn up. Yeah, this makes sense. It, it makes sense to me. But I want you to think about something for just a second. We learned a few weeks ago that God's plans don't always make sense. I think we could make the conclusion that God is illogical many, many times. Think about this. Joshua believed the Gibeonites because their clothes were worn out when he walked through a desert for 40 years and his clothes never wore out. That's the God that Joshua served. But he was basing it on what he saw and what he thought and what he felt in his heart. Many times we do this. We, we're sympathetic I picked on the men a minute ago. I'll pick on the ladies. Sometimes you guys are sympathetic. Your, your feelings get in the way and you fall into a deception. Men do that too. But we cannot base things on sight and logic and sympathy. We have to be people of faith going to our leader for counsel. We can't afford to make decisions like the Israelites were doing. Let's go to verse 19. This is where the leaders are going to answer the people that are upset by this deception. And it says, all the leaders answered the people of Israel. We have sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. We cannot touch them. Uh, this is how we will treat them. We will let them live so no, so no wrath will fall on us because of the oath we swore to them. Now, this is interesting. You've got to think a little bit about this. But if we're going to live in victory over, if we're going to have victory over deception, we must not make a bad decision after we've made a bad decision. Does that make sense? Joshua made a bad decision making an alliance with people in the land. He was deceived into doing it, but you see the response. I have a tendency to believe that after they were deceived, that they had a little prayer time. And they said, God, we have sinned and we don't want to be on the roller coaster ride anymore. They didn't want to make another mistake. You know, so many times when when, when we see deception, especially deception in warfare, we think that we're justified in whatever our response is. Well, they deceived us so we can deceive them. They slandered us so we can slander them. They stole from us so we can steal from them. But Joshua is telling us here, we can't make another bad decision after we've already made a bad decision. We have to take God's word seriously. God's word says you make a vow, fulfill it. God's word says it's better to not make a vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. So they were not going to follow up a bad decision with a bad decision. We have to be people like that. So many times we're deceived. We can't listen to that deception. Oh, go ahead and get revenge. That's okay. No, it's not. Scripture says that vengeance is the Lord's. God will repay every wrong that is committed against us. We have to trust in that. We have to be people that take God's word seriously. Then and only then can we have victory over deception. Finally, let's look at verses 22 and 23. It says, Joshua summoned the Gibeonites and said to them, why did you deceive us by telling us that you lived far away from us when in fact you lived among us? Therefore you are cursed and you will always be slaves, woodcutters, and water carriers for the house of my God. Now this is an interesting, this is an interesting little exchange here. We know that they feared for their lives. We know that Joshua doesn't want to follow up sin with sin, but we were surprised at how he 
receives the Gibeonites. He curses them, which is, that had to, that, that had to be some, somewhat pleasurable for Joshua to be able to curse them. But I want you to see what he did. He put his failure to work for him. And I want to tell you this, if we're going to have victory over deception, we've got to put our personal failures at work for us. Most of the time when we fail in life, we want to hide our failures. We want to put it in the closet. We want to do it behind closed doors. We don't want anybody to find out about it. This would have been easy for Joshua to do. They have been on this roller coaster ride. They could have just gotten rid of the Gibeonites. They could have put them over a couple of hills, uh, you know, two or three, four hills away so that they didn't have to see them every day. But Joshua... Let his failure serve him. I want to tell you, there's an important lesson here for us. Here it is. What do you do with your failures? What do you do with your failures? What do you do when you sin? What do you do when you're deceived? Have you ever thought about letting those things work for you? And letting those things bring glory to God? The Gibeonites were were providing work providing labor for the house of God. They were bringing glory to God in a very menial way, but they were, they were letting this, this sinful situation, this deceptive situation work in their behalf. I want to share with you a story. Last fall, I got into a Bible study with... Um, with some of my coworkers, they were all younger men. And um, this thing got started because they were always asking me questions about the Bible and I was always giving them the right answer. And uh, they had an unrealistic view of me. They said, we want to have a Bible study with you because you're so wise and you have all the answers. And you know, that felt pretty good. I haven't been in that position too many times in my life where I'm the wisest one in the group. And as I began to prepare for the Bible study, it hit me. God began to speak to me and he began to say this. Most of your wisdom, most all of your wisdom, Scotty, has come from your failures. From failing and then learning from the consequence. And that's, that's, that's a sad thing to say, but you know what? It's truth. And so God began to push me to share my failures with this group of young guys. And every week, God gave me the opportunity to share my failures. I'd say, maybe not, maybe not this week. And God would say, yep, there it is right there. There's an opportunity. Share your moral failures with these guys. Share your financial failures. Share the times that you failed as a parent, failed as a husband, failed as a businessman. And I want to tell you, something started happening. They started being real with me about their struggles. And we started praying together about walking with Christ in obedience. And really what it is, it's just called transparency. We were transparent with each other and we were encouraged by what we were hearing. You know, all those guys thought that they were on an island by themselves. They thought they were the only ones dealing with certain sins. And when they found out that I was the same, that that had to be a little discouraging. Oh, I'm gonna keep dealing with this? Yes, you're gonna keep dealing with it. But there was encouragement in that group and it was real fellowship. My old mentor told me that there are two types of testimonies. Testimonies that show people what to do and testimonies that show people what not to do. And both are equally as important. So transparency is key. We can work our failures for us. They can do some wood cutting and some some water bringing to people's lives. That's what transparency does. It brings glory to God. And you know what it does? It exposes sin. It brings sin to light. It tells people, hey, I was deceived in this way. 
don't follow my example. And my prayer is, is that by being transparent, God can be glorified. I want to tell you, there is some warning when you want to be transparent with somebody. You risk a lot. You risk a lot when you tell things about yourself. Sometimes people gossip about you. Sometimes there are consequences that come with your truthfulness. But understand this, it's truth. You're not hiding. You're you're, you're exposing your real self to people. Joshua didn't try to hide his sin. He, He let it be known. Yes, we were deceived by the Gibeonites, but they are working for us for the glory of God. That is what God can do with failure. He can take failure and he can create victory from it. Deception is real. Deception is dangerous. And I see it like this. You can either be defeated by it or you can fight against it. You can have victory over it. My question to you this morning is how will you respond to deception? Deception.